Hello, and once again, I'm delighted to go around the world and say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all of our global audience. It's 7 a.m. in Washington, D.C., 12 noon in London, 8 p.m. in Singapore and Manila, 9 p.m. in Tokyo. This LSE Ideas public event is on the topic of U.S.-China relations, increasingly volatile, blowing hot and cold, mostly hot in recent times, which may or may not change with U.S. presidential elections. But our specific focus today is on what it means for the rest of us, those in East Asia in particular, who are inextricably linked to both the giants. A quick housekeeping note before we start, this event is being recorded and the recording will likely be posted online. Also, we'd like to make this an interactive conversation. So please engage with the Q&A button on Zoom and ask some questions. Now we're delighted and privileged to be joined by this panel for at least two reasons. Not only are they distinguished in their own right, they bring a diversity of perspectives that should allow us to explore this subject from many different angles. Japan, Philippines, or ASEAN, Singapore, defense, trade, investment, all of that. And I will introduce them uh, just before they speak. Uh, so let me start with Professor Kotaro Tamura. Kotaro Tamura is a former senator and parliamentary secretary for economic policy in Japan. I think the first time I met him, he was explaining the policies of the Prime Minister Shinzo Abe, or Abenomics, to an international audience. He's now an adjunct professor at the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy in Singapore and an Asia Fellow at Milken Institute, and a senior advisor to the China Europe International Business School in Shanghai. Uh, a fun fact, uh, the latest of his more than 10 books has been made into a TV drama in Japan. Professor Tamura, welcome, and uh, thank you for joining us. And please, could we have your opening remarks, please? Thank you for having me. I'm very excited to join uh, this fantastic panel. So I basically touch upon two points. Uh, one is a uh, you know, product that will be brought about uh, from the seemingly uh, increasingly uh, contentious rivalry between two giants. And then uh, I will touch upon what Japan is doing and hopefully Japan will do uh, in the future. So one is that, you know, I would rather focus on the positivity and the bright side uh, of the products uh, made uh, by the, this uh, competition between two titans. Uh, of course, there are so many concerns and the negativities and uh, that will be covered uh, by uh, much more intelligent uh, fellows and my friends uh, speaking after myself. So, uh, you know, competition is sometimes and always uh, doing good and bad. And that reminds me the fact that, uh, you know, the kind of a very uh, traditional rhetoric Sputnik effect that uh, came through the huge intense competition uh, between uh, former Soviet Union and the US on the space uh, project. So this time around, I can say to some extent uh, that will happen in more extensive way. Uh, you know, from uh, not only space technologies, but also AI, supercomputing, quantum computing, and food production, uh, renewable energy, battery technologies, and the medical technology and so on. So uh, both uh, big superpowers have enough uh, hinterland population and uh, enough scientists and enough level of the economic, uh, I know, economic scale and also technological development stage. So they will, uh, will invest uh, almost all resources they have into the technological uh, race between the two and that will be uh, deployed uh, to many ways 
uh, into the societies because it's good for business, it's good for competition, it's good for economic development for further uh, of the, their countries. And that will be also applicable to the countries, I mean, the rest of the Asia, to convince uh, the rest of the Asia to join their side. So uh, taking a side is difficult for the rest of Asia, but at the same time, convincing the rest of Asia to join their side is also not easy task for them to achieve. So I think beauty of Asian countries, including Japan, Japan is uh, you know, also uh, sitting in the middle of the two titans. Very difficult way. Uh, like many other countries, China is already the largest uh, trade partner. At the same time, US is the most important uh, security allies for Japan. So it's very difficult to take one side, but Japan is joining in many ways to US side. But at the same time, uh, new administration is very pro-business and very uh, you know, uh, forward looking uh, to do more for the inbound tourism. So China is very important in many ways. Uh, but, uh, you know, the beauty of Asian nations is not uh, saying black and white very clearly. So we are obscure. We are between yes and no. So we can uh, have a wisdom to reframe uh, yes and no into many ways. So I think Asian countries will be benefiting to implement uh, those technologies refined through the competition of two titans, such as AI, supercomputers, robotics, automation, food technologies, and uh, renewable energy technologies and medical technologies. And not only technologies, but also infrastructure building and uh, enhancing con uh, connectivity. So those two titans will uh, relate in those space as well. And Japan is in this respect uh, doing, uh, you know, along with uh, US and we are announcing uh, free and open in the Pacific corridor. And the other side is mentioning about one belt, one load. So we are ready, both are ready to do more for the infrastructure, infrastructure development of the rest of the Asia and enhancing connectivity physically and digitally. So saying not clearly yes and no, uh, Asian countries also will be benefited from both sides and intensing, intensifying competition uh, between two countries will benefit, as I have mentioned, technological development wise and also infrastructure enhancement and uh, improving digital and physical connectivity of the rest of Asia. So Asian countries will be benefited through two titans battle over two uh, big uh, space technological development and also infrastructure building. Yeah, uh, there's many challenges and the negativities and concerns coming from uh, the lace between two titans that seems like, you know, only intensifying regardless of the which administration will be taking over US side. So that's uh, the, you know, my points and what Japan is do and uh, will do is that Japan is taking a balancing uh, mediation, mediator uh, play between the two countries. And, uh, you know, Japan is, uh, in, in, under the Trump administration, Japan is do a lot. You know, US is American first, China is not respecting IPs. So uh, we are mediating, you know, saying respect more IPs to China. And the American first, forget about the American first, coming back to the international platform. So we are balancing that. And we do actually, uh, a lot, including TPP 11. And, uh, you know, today is the inauguration of the ASEAN summit. And uh, probably RCEP will be agreed. And this is the first free trade agreement done between China 
South Korea and Japan. And 30-40% of the trade and 30-40% of the global GDP will be covered to some extent by this agreement. This is for the first time. And Japan is big. Uh, you know, we can call uh, Japan as a, uh, you know, upper medium sized power. So Japan is number five in firepower, number three in the economic power. So we are ready to do more, you know, trade wise and the militarily we are helping uh, surrounding nations like Philippines providing, uh, you know, later system to Philippines and, uh, you know, providing many infrastructure that's not necessarily directly connected to the military, but, you know, enhancing the connectivity and the infrastructure for the economic development. So Japan will do more, although we are, our resources is limited because of the shrinking aging population, but, you know, we have, we still have a deep pocket, uh, you know, uh, the budget for international relations and the trade and, uh, you know, enhancing uh, international securities is relatively small than compared to the Japan's uh, social security burdens. So uh, I will uh, get him, how many minutes do I have? Uh, 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 you can take a couple of minutes to wrap up if you'd like, and I'll come okay. back to you in the next round. So, uh, you know, Japan is uh, in a position that we're not, we're not able to relocate ourselves. You know, we need to stay home and we, need, we want to keep si uh, safe distancing, social distancing to the unstoppable, seemingly unstoppable neighbor, but seemingly unstoppable neighbor is just cutting into the boundary of social distancing. So we'll be having, uh, you know, some challenges and uh, concerns, but at the same time, uh, you know, that concerns and the negativities will be covered, uh, already shared by most of the panelists here and the audience here, but I want to touch upon, I want to, you know, cover the bright side coming okay. from the, uh, you know, intensifying race between two superpowers and Japan is doing a lot and Japan will do more uh, for the rest of the Asia. So I'm sorry, disorganized manner, but this is my points. Thank oh, you so thank much. You. Thank you so much, Tamara-san. That, that's given us food for thought. Um, optimism, you seem to be optimistic that these are opponents and not enemies. And you're suggesting that the rest of Asia can remain ambiguous between yes and no, constructive ambiguity. Um, and I love that uh, safe distancing comment at the end. I'm sure we'll come back to you on some of these. Uh, a reminder to the audience to please start posting questions while the remarks are still fresh in our minds. Next, I'd like to welcome Mr. Cesar Purisima. Cesar Purisima was finance minister of the Philippines between 2010 and 2016. He's a founding member of the private equity platform, uh, Eklas Capital, and is also an Asian fellow of Milken Institute. Not surprisingly, he sits on the boards and advisory councils of several major organizations nationally and internationally. Cesar Purisima, over to you, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Lutfi, and uh, to my fellow fa panelists, good evening from uh, uh, Manila. You know, looking at the title of the, uh, the panel, When Elephants uh, Fight, reminds me of uh, an African uh, proverb that whether uh, uh, elephants fight or make love, the grass gets trampled. And, uh, you know, I would be uh, careful to uh, rush to say that ASEAN is that grass that the elephants like the US and China trample on. Because to say so means that uh, ASEAN is a, just a passive uh, victim and does not have any agency to shape its own destiny. Uh, I don't really agree with that statement as I will uh, explain uh, later on in my uh, uh, remarks. Uh, before I go on to that, uh, uh, I would like to, uh, uh, for those who are not as familiar with uh, ASEAN, no? ASEAN is the aggregation of 10 countries uh, in Asia that uh, used to be called the uh, dominoes uh, many, many years ago that were about to fall to uh, uh, communism. Uh, but uh, with the advent of peace in uh, the region, as well as the opening up of trade, uh, the region has uh, become one of the fastest growing uh, economically. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, it's now uh, China's largest uh, uh, trading uh, partner. 
the region has benefited a lot from uh, globalization. Uh, Two thirds of its trade is uh, subject to free trade agreement. Uh, ASEAN's vision when it was uh, formed from an economic standpoint is really to be the hub of uh, Asia trade. And geographically, when you look at the map, uh, it straddles right in the middle of what uh, Trump refers to as the Indo-Pacific uh, uh, region. So ASEAN has uh, free trade agreements with uh, five of its dialogue uh, uh, partners. Its trade is almost equal to its uh, uh, GDP. Yeah? And uh, it has a very favorable uh, demography and uh, is expected to continue to uh, uh, use trade and globalization as uh, an engine uh, for growth together with uh, uh, tourism uh, be uh, becoming uh, a major engine for uh, uh, economic growth in the region. However, this um, uh, conflict uh, between China and the uh, uh, US, uh, unfortunately for the region, uh, uh, the, the region has become the venue uh, for such uh, uh, conflict for several reasons. No? Uh, we, uh, ASEAN straddles the South China Sea. Uh, it's right at the heart of uh, uh, the region. Uh, and uh, that's, uh, that holds several of the territorial disputes involving uh, China and the other claimant uh, uh, states. No? And of course, involving the US, you have uh, freedom of navigation uh, uh, issues. No? and broader uh, geopolitical tensions uh, in the Asia Pacific uh, theater. The region is also incorporated in uh, China's uh, uh, Belt and Road uh, Initiative uh, from both the Belt uh, and the Road side, uh, the Maritime Road, the uh, Silk Belt. Uh, third, uh, the, the, the region uh, obviously uh, has been affected by the pandemic that uh, uh, has uh, affected uh, not just uh, uh, China and the region, but the rest of the uh, world. No? And uh, we are also um, at the middle of the uh, trade and tech nationalism that's uh, going on, uh, the, the, the duel for supremacy uh, between uh, uh, both uh, uh, countries. No? So we are a host and a venue. No? And uh, we can easily be uh, uh, trampled like a grass if we do not uh, you know, focus on making sure that ASEAN is not just considered an events organizer, but really uh, a, a player in this uh, uh, dialogue. Uh, why did they say events organizer? Because ASEAN has these meetings uh, several times a year uh, among its members and its dialogue uh, uh, partners. Uh, but for it to uh, uh, shape the narrative and be a playmaker in this uh, uh, dispute, which is to its interest, it's important that ASEAN doesn't lose sight of its uh, centrality. Because it's very easy for the big powers to try and uh, uh, separate, uh, you know, uh, and uh, break into uh, the different uh, interests uh, composing uh, ASEAN. And this happened during the chairmanship of uh, Cambodia, uh, for example. And that is why I think it's a good time to remember that uh, for ASEAN not to be trampled upon so that uh, it can actually help uh, shape its uh, uh, destiny, which is going to be crucial to its success, uh, ASEAN centrality uh, must be uh, uh, emphasized. Um, Kotaro san mentioned the uh, RCEP uh, that's about to be signed. Uh, I actually uh, preferred RCEP over TPP because of ASEAN centrality. Uh, in RCEP, the whole of ASEAN uh, is included, whereas in TPP, only four of our uh, uh, members were uh, included and could have actually uh, become a major friction had it become, uh, you know, had it been signed the way it was uh, originally designed, including the uh, US. No? Now, centrality is not uh, uh, the, the end goal. Centrality is about the process of making sure that uh, in the discussions, uh, ASEAN's uh, uh, is at the primary uh, heart 
of uh, uh, ASEAN interests at the heart of the discussions rather than the goal of uh, uh, making sure that uh, all of us are in unanimity. No? Uh, that is why in the ASEAN Charter, they came up with a mechanism called the uh, ASEAN minus X. No? Uh, that's to give uh, allowance to, uh, uh, for member countries to opt out uh, and uh, allow ASEAN to be able to proceed. Uh, and uh, uh, with, with several key uh, initiatives without unanimity. You know? And this is uh, crucial and sometimes is referred to as the ASEAN uh, uh, way. You know? uh, centrality will also allow uh, ASEAN uh, to uh, play the role of being an intermediary you know? uh, among the, you know, the, the two uh, uh, key powers, the, the, the lead actors in this uh, uh, conflict. Uh, the challenge of ASEAN, though, is that uh, unlike the EU, the the ASEAN Secretariat Secretariat is very weak. You know? uh, so for this uh, to really uh, become a reality, uh, we need to continue to strengthen the ASEAN uh, uh, Secretariat and also try to uh, and hope that, uh, uh, similar to the original founders, the leaders during the founding of ASEAN. Uh, have leaders that can actually, uh, uh, you know, speak in the global stage uh, about the interest of uh, uh, ASEAN. Uh, I think uh, uh, this uh, still has a long way to uh, uh, go before we can truly say that uh, uh, we've achieved that, but I think uh, uh, it's important that we embark on this uh, journey. And to embark on this journey, we need to make sure that uh, we continue to focus on integration, uh, the three pillars of uh, ASEAN uh, uh, integration, and uh, to make sure that um, in dealing with uh, the non-economic issues of the conflict between the US and China, that we break it up you know, into its different uh, components. You know. For example, on uh, dispute resolution, uh, that one, I think ASEAN should not uh, uh, take the lead, but rather allow the claimant countries to uh, work on it uh, on a bilateral basis. But on tension management, that's where ASEAN can uh, uh, take the lead uh, and uh, hopefully uh, work towards the you know, um, uh, agreement and implementation of the uh, code of conduct, for example, in the South uh, uh, China uh, Sea. And uh, in uh, the escalation uh, also of uh, uh, tension, uh, that's where ASEAN can play uh, a role uh, uh, also. This is clearly, uh, uh, you know, like walking a, a tightrope because it is hard to uh, decouple the security as well as the economic uh, uh, issues. The reality for ASEAN is uh, given our proximity uh, to uh, uh, China and given the growth of the Chinese economy, especially coming out of the uh, COVID uh, uh, crisis, uh, China will continue to become our biggest uh, uh, economic uh, uh, partner. And yet from a security standpoint, uh, historically, uh, the US has been uh, the partner of many major uh, ASEAN uh, uh, states. The Philippines in particular is a, the, is a treaty uh, uh, ally of, uh, of the uh, U.S. Now, so so for, for, for ASEAN not to be trampled upon in this uh, uh, fight, uh, many things, uh, we, we, we have to uh, uh, not just be an event organizer in summary, but uh, we really need to uh, be uh, part of the dialogue and be a, a player uh, maker, uh, not be looked at as a peripheral uh, uh, issue. And this uh, can be done by continuing to focus on ASEAN uh, uh, centrality and being smart about the decoupling of security and economic issues, as well as the breaking down the security issues into different components so that we can come up with uh, pragmatic uh, uh, solutions uh, to reduce the tension and uh, come up with pathways uh, that may be considered win-win by both sides right. uh, in uh, 
resolving some of the more ticklish uh, uh, issues. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Mr. Purisima. So in order for ASEAN to have agency, it's important that it's not picked apart, that it's seen as an integrated, coherent unit is what I understand to be one of your messages. Now, a special welcome and a special word of gratitude from me to our next speaker, Dr. Lynn Kwok. Um, Dr. Kwok joins us from Washington, D.C., where it's very early in the morning, so I'm truly, truly grateful. Dr. Lynn Kwok is a senior fellow, a Shangri-La Dialogue senior fellow at the International Institute for Strategic Studies. She co-edits the Asia-Pacific Regional Security Assessment, one of the Institute's signature publications. She's also a visiting professor at Georgetown University's School of Foreign Service. And she sits on the World Economic Forum Global Future Council on geopolitics and international security. Dr. Kwok, could we have the benefit of your perspective, please? Thank you so much, Dr. Um, and thank you, LSE Ideas, for um, the invitation to speak here today. It's a real pleasure. As you mentioned, um, I'm teaching at Georgetown University at the School of One's Foreign Service uh, this semester. I'm enjoying my time with the students very much, and I hope in the audience we also have many students, uh, and we will also have many questions from them. Um, so thank you, and a warm welcome to everyone. Um, Coming back to uh, the title of today's seminar, um, Cezanne mentioned how, you know, this is an African proverb, but proverb. it was also kind of um, co-opted by the first prime minister of Singapore. And he mentioned that as a small and open country, Singapore will always be vulnerable to what happens around us. So when elephants fight, the grass suffers, but when they make love, the grass suffers also. So I think the point he was trying to make was less that small countries do not have agency, but the fact that they are vulnerable in the face of um, the turbulence created by um, great power competition. And so I'd first like to address um, uh, how that competition is affecting um, the smaller countries of ASEAN. Um, and then after that, look at what um, uh, Cesar Parasima mentioned, about, like how they are trying to create greater strategic options for themselves. So on the first point, I think as, um, as uh, Kotaro-san mentioned earlier, um, they, uh, ASEAN, uh, in the case of Japan, ASEAN countries are trying to avoid having to make a choice between the United States and China. But I think the tensions between the two superpowers are fast narrowing the strategic options. And I think the uh, clearest enunciation of how this is happening uh, was set out by the Singapore Prime Minister Lee Hsien Loong in, in a recent piece for the Foreign Affairs, which I urge anyone who hasn't read to, to read. So I think he highlights several points, and I'd like to um, uh, really underscore a few of them. Uh, some of these have been mentioned by previous speakers, but I'd just like to put them all together. Uh, so first of all, um, the choice, uh, the, the position that ASEAN countries are placed in because of US-China competition puts them in an impossible bind because the US has been and continues to be an essential security presence for the region. This cannot, this role cannot be played by uh, China for several reasons, not least because of tensions with several ASEAN states over uh, uh, both territorial and maritime disputes in the South China Sea. The US, moreover, continues to be the largest source of foreign direct investment for much of Asia, though China's fast catching up. China, on its part, on the other hand, is the largest trading power of uh, many Asian countries, including all US allies in the region. It's been ASEAN's largest trading partner for over a decade now. It's also perceived as having the wind behind its economic sales. And I think that perception is, is greatly helping uh, China in terms of uh, help uh, swaying uh, countries um, to, to, to take a position that might be more favorable to China. Now, in the face of this dilemma, ASEAN has sought to do several things, right? Um, we saw last year in June or July, um, ASEAN issued uh, an ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Some took that to mean that ASEAN was throwing its weight behind the United States because the Indo-Pacific terminology is something that 
this um, current U.S. administration, the Trump administration, has favored um, as a kind of um, pushback against uh, China. Um, and it's seeking to put together a like-minded group um, of uh, allies and partners. However, if we look at uh, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific, um, it's a far more nuanced document than that. Although it adopts the Indo-Pacific terminology, it also references the important, importance of infrastructure development to the region. Um, and that, I think, is a nod to China's Belt and Road Initiative. It also avoids mention of the quadrilateral security dialogue, which is considered the more muscular arm of, um, of, of the Indo-Pacific strategy. Um, and China resents the, the quadrilateral security dialogue or quad as it's more commonly known. And so uh, uh, the ASEAN outlook on the Indo-Pacific focuses instead on the need to promote economic in integration and connectivity. So it avoids any sort of military um, statement um, and focuses very much on it economic integration and connectivity. Now, even the title of the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific, that suggests a certain distancing from the document because it's not ASEAN's, it's not ASEAN's um, Indo-Pacific strategy, it's ASEAN's outlook on the strategy. So I think that has been um, something that uh, diplomats in the region have taken pains to, to, to highlight. Um, but of course, you know, in the media, the media sometimes, you know, likes to jump on, um, uh, not all media, of course, but sometimes, you know, we just look at the words in the Pacific and say, ah, there you go. Uh, it's clearly accepted by the region. No, um, I think the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific was, was a very nuanced document and I urge everyone, all the students in the audience at least, to, to read this. So that's on sort of like the dilemma that, um, that ASEAN, ASEAN and ASEAN countries face and how it's broaching the subject beyond the ASEAN Outlook on the Indo-Pacific. Uh, as uh, Mr. Cesar Purusima mentioned earlier, you know, it's, it's seeking to assert ASEAN uh, centrality um, in order to, to, to create greater strategic space for itself. But of course, incantations of centrality are not going to make it so. And a key test, I believe, for the region will be whether or not it's able to deal with hotspots in the region, including the South China Sea. Um, uh, there's been talk about how negotiations of the code of conduct are continuing. And I think that's a positive sign. It's better that parties are speaking than not speaking at all. But I think few are that optimis optimistic that a meaningful code of conduct uh, will be concluded. In addition, I think there has been unfortunately no strong statement um, from, uh, from ASEAN on the South China Sea. As, um, to date, I think we have only seen the Philippines because it brought the case against China, um, as well as Indonesia clearly reference um, the the ruling and uh, and its um, the award and the and its various rulings. Um, we have not seen many of the other Southeast Asian countries um, urge China to respect the ruling, um, nor have we seen um, ASEAN make such a statement. This should be a basic um, point with, for which there should be little dispute. I think it's quite clear that ASEAN, because it has repeated how important international law, including the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea is to ASEAN, it should be a no brainer that it should also mention that rulings as a result um, that have stemmed from you know, a validly constituted tribunal and international law, uh, those should be respected by all parties involved. Um, China itself calls itself a law-abiding member of the international community. It has ratified UNCLOS. China should have no quarrels with ASEAN mentioning the importance of uh, this tribunal award. So first, you know, in, um, ASEAN centrality is the means by which ASEAN has tried to create strategic space for itself. Second, it has also sought to um, strengthen relations with middle powers uh, in order to provide um, alternatives or perhaps even complements to the United States and China. And um, Kotaro San has mentioned, you know, the role that Japan plays in this respect, and it's certainly playing an important role. Uh, countries like Australia also appear to be stepping up to the plate with its recent uh, defense strategic update, which I think is an important document recognizing the challenges of the rising challenges in the region, um, but also that, you know, 
Australia needs to pay a greater role to its immediate neighbourhood, as well as to commit to, uh, to defence spending or the, the increased defence spending that it has uh, promised. Um, and finally, ASEAN countries are seeking to stress the importance of international law, including UNCLOS, in their efforts to create greater strategic space for themselves. And I think this last part is essential um, because, you know, in order to frame um, what's happening, not as a choice between the United States on the one hand and China on the other hand, what ASEAN countries and ASEAN itself needs to do um, more of is to frame their choice about adherence to international law and a rules-based order, which all, including China, should want because it, it should want because it benefits all countries. Um, so it's a choice between adherence to the rules-based order and a world in which might is right and the complete chaos that is likely to follow. So not a choice between the two superpowers, but a choice proactively for um, a rules-based international order. So I think I'll stop there. Thank you so much. That's terrific. So reframing the choice between two principles rather than uh, the two powers, the two elephants. Thank you so much. And uh, now we uh, come to, last but not least, um, Alex Capri, uh, our final speaker. Alex is a research fellow at uh, Heinrich Foundation and a senior fellow at uh, the Business School of the National University of Singapore. He has over 20 years of experience in supply chains, trade, logistics. Between 2007 and 2012, he was a partner and regional lead of KPMG's trade and customs practice in Asia Pacific based in Hong Kong. Alex, the floor is yours. Uh, you're on mute, Alex, sorry. Thank you. I was saying thank you very much, Lupe, and good evening, everyone. Um, some interesting uh, insights from, from the speakers before me. Um, I'm going to um, step back uh, just a little bit, and I'm going to uh, uh, share with you um, what I see as the key trends or dynamics that are uh, influencing this systemic rivalry that we're witnessing between the United States and China, uh, and then uh, apply that to global value chains and then, and then bring that down to the, uh, to the Southeast Asia or the Asia Pacific uh, theater, um, and then talk about where uh, we might be going uh, from, from here. Um, so and I'm going to focus a great deal on this phenomenon of techno-nationalism. This is what I've been uh, focusing on now for uh, a number of years. I have a book coming out on that uh, uh, in early next year. Um, and so in the context of this systemic rivalry, um, we're, in a, we're in a period uh, where we are not in a trade war. This is not a trade war. This is a paradigm shift. This is a complete shift or tilting away from decades of laissez-faire, um, open trade, um, uh, 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 essentially uh, frameworks of rules that have been uh, that has that have been designed and dominated by the United States and its allies, and we are now approaching a kind of neo-mercantilist world uh, on certain levels. And when we put this in the context of China and the United States, I want to focus on techno-nationalism. And what is that? Techno-nationalism is essentially um, when a nation equates its technology prowess, its capabilities, its innovation levels with its national security issues, with its economic security and its economic competitiveness, and now I think, and this is the really important thing that is really starting to skew the way we've looked at globalization, and that is how techno-nationalism influences social stability and political stability. In other words, how is technology tethered to very key core values, either in terms of the uh, promotion of those values or the suppression of those values? And those values the core values that we're talking about, again, linked to technology and its use, uh, focus on privacy, the right to privacy, censorship, or the right to freedom of expression, 
and surveillance. How is technology used to either further or suppress those? And those are translating into what I would call um, the fragmentation, the balkanization of the global landscape into um, let's call it digital democracy or digital human rights. And let's call the other, the other sort of techno authoritarianism and then everything that's sort of in between, kind of wavering between those two. And these from a technology standpoint are focused on hard technology, like for example, semiconductors, you know, to what extent do companies use semiconductor technology to pursue those ends? Um, now we're, we're linking that to data, data as a strategic commodity, how data is used, um, how it is ring fenced, how it is protected, et cetera. And thirdly, platforms and even apps. And we see this famously with the, the, the TikTok uh, issue in the United States and India banning a number of apps and so forth, uh, Chinese apps. So the, the end result is a bifurcated global value chain. It's, a, it's not a zero sum game. You know, when we talk about decoupling, when we talk about reshoring and ring fencing of industries, I want to emphasize the word strategic. So we're in a period of strategic decoupling, strategic reshoring and strategic ring fencing of, of industries along those three lines in very strategic areas, what we could call dual use goods. These are, these are commercial goods. Uh, these are ubiquitous. Uh, they comprise um, essentially all of the foundational emerging industries, um, everything on China's, you know, made in China 2025 list. These are all dual use technologies. They could be used commercially or for military purposes. Therefore, depending on who's using it and for what, they could be restricted. Um, so, so the bifurcation that's happening is this strategic decoupling and, there, and therefore we're seeing more localization, uh, more fragmentation and this so-called, what we could call an in China for China strategy, an in China for China supply chain, an in India for India supply chain and so on and so forth. Um, so these are all uh, very important dynamics uh, that are occurring. And, uh, and the way that these different types of non-tariff measures, which are far more important and far more significant than tariffs, um, these are now linked to you know, naming specific companies like Huawei, SMIC, the semiconductor, Hike Vision, SenseTime, Dahua. These are all AI companies, uh, you know, uh, digital, digital surveillance companies and so on, uh, obviously 5G. So again, if we apply the use of these technologies, we're seeing the linkage of sanctions and export controls being levied against these companies for things like uh, the imposition of the national security law in Hong Kong and how those companies play a role. Now, we, I can come back to that later, but um, so, so this is a very significant part of the landscape and how is this then uh, spilling over into Southeast Asia? How is this affecting Southeast Asian supply chains, ecosystems, et cetera? And the answer is, again, um, where there is strategic decoupling, we're going to see the relocation or the diversification. And we're seeing that as uh, supply chains move to Vietnam, they, they, you know, they, they're moving to Malaysia. Singapore has become a very, very interesting location um, as it looks to attract and it will attract um, uh, semiconductor, certainly the high end of the value chain around the R&D side, uh, semiconductor as it, uh, as it rolls out its own 5G, um, Singapore is essentially a model uh, for, you know, going back to what uh, Tamura-san had said earlier and others, um, is there a third way? Is it a binary choice? Does it mean that the countries in Asia are confronted with only a binary choice? And I don't think they are. And I think Singapore, I mean, uh, some, you know, the, the less developed emerging markets have, a, have more of a dilemma in terms of making that binary choice than the mid-level 
uh, uh, countries such as Malaysia and certainly Singapore, um, because there is a third way. Uh, and I think, you know, I think Singapore is demonstrating what that looks like. So Singapore is building 5G network here. Uh, they're building their own uh, specs into their infrastructure. They have um, avoided the binary choice by inviting three major contractors to come in, including Ericsson and Nokia. Um, Huawei at this point has a very, very minor role on the periphery. But what's more interesting is uh, what Singapore has done is they have built an ecosystem using uh, locally based startup companies, um, using um, you know uh, an open source kind of environment to bring in end to end in the 5G network innovators, um, you know tech startups, and it's working uh, it's working quite nicely. Um, so so you know. We could be seeing, I mean, obviously Singapore is not the rest of Southeast Asia, but the rest of Southeast Asia is also waiting um, to see how this 5G uh, uh, scenario plays out. And that might be the best role, not to rush into 5G immediately, but let the open, um, the open networks and the open source model take effect. And then you know, within a number of years, we will have multiple new players in that landscape uh, and, and that will, again, alleviate this pressure for binary choice. Um, wanted to, I'll, close with, I'll close with this. Um, well, let me just mention Vietnam very quickly. So Vietnam is a very interesting country in that Vietnam has signed uh, FTAs with very progressive, um, uh, very progressive trade deals. So it's signed an FTA with the European Union. It's a member of the CPTPP. If you look at the frameworks of rules, that are, that are baked into these very progressive free trade agreements, they address privacy issues. They address uh, uh, sustainable trade. They address transparency. They address a lot of these values that if we go back to this, this fragmenting of, of, of ideological blocks tethered to technology, these are very, uh, these are very favorable to Western values, okay? But, Vietnam also has a huge influx of Chinese investment uh, and Chinese companies that are offshoring out of China into Vietnam. So how does Vietnam handle this scenario? Um, and so Vietnam is going to be a very interesting place to watch because from a corporate governance standpoint, um, you know, we're going to, we're going to, it's going to be very interesting to see uh, how the government um, complies and, and enforces uh, specific. So I, I think that's a, that's a very interesting thing. And uh, finally, I'll just close with um, Tamura San, you said, you mentioned the moonshot. Uh, and I do think that um, we are on the verge of another moonshot uh, as we see the, this coalescing more of sort of the liberal democracies of the world and their technology values around public-private partnerships um, and around, uh, you know, innovation investments and so forth. And that is going to trickle back to Southeast Asia because there will be supply chains that will align themselves along rule frameworks that will result in, again, shifting supply chains throughout Southeast Asia uh, and investment and so forth. I'll close with that. Thank you very much, Alex. So we have the full sweep of the opening remarks now and a good flow of questions coming up as well. Um, let me quickly go through one round of my questions and then we'll dive straight into that. Um, Tamura-san, Japan is paying companies a lot of money to come out of China and either go back home to Japan or relocate to a third country. Is that aggressive decoupling or is it uh, just risk management? Mm. Yeah, uh, as we have mentioned, recently Prime Minister Suga announced the uh, Japanese government will subsidize the companies uh, which relocate their companies and uh, supply chains from China to Southeast Asia. So we find that you know, uh, China is trying to uh, put every supply chain beneath uh, their uh, you know, uh, handle. You know, China tried to put the, themselves to the top of every supply chain you know, 
uh, not only business wise, uh, but also as a you know national security wise, it's a, a little bit uh, you know concerning to Japan. So Japan is now uh, subsidizing the relocation of the supply chains from China to Southeast Asia. So yeah, uh, yes, uh, and uh, also uh, Japan is uh, uh, trying to make it uh, you know good excuse and a good start point for the Indo-Pacific free and open corridor. Uh, so, you know, try to pave the way uh, to let them join, uh, to take a balance between Belt and Road initially. But at the same time, please don't forget, Japan Prime Minister, the former Prime Minister, Shinzo Abe, announced uh, one and a half years ago, he will join, Japan will join Belt and Road Initiative as well. And the several companies are already implemented into the virtual initiatives. So we are not uh, fully taking balance. We are hedging at the same time. I see. I see. So it is hedging, it's risk management. It's interesting how you have this dual world on, on the security side on the one hand, and just how intertwined you guys are from an economics uh, point of view. Uh, I was reading about a third of, of um, all spending by foreigners in Japan just before the pandemic was from Chinese tourists. So it's clearly a big uh, chunk yeah, of money. 70%. I see. My question to now, uh, Mr. Cesar Purisima, please. Um, clearly this economic linkage with China is uh, one directional in that all the time that China has had a trade surplus with the US and the EU, it's had a trade deficit with China, with South Korea, with Taiwan, with Australia, even with the countries where it's not exactly a deficit. So Indonesia, for example, it's more of a balance, but China is still the biggest export destination for these countries. I think you know, half of primary exports, uh, mining minerals from Indonesia go to China. If China now rotates its business model to this dual circulation, domestic consumption services based economic structure, um, is the rest of ASEAN really able to pivot their business model? Are they agile enough to respond to this requirement? Um, because it looks like it's quite urgent with or without US, conf US China conflict. In fact, I, I see the dual circulation model and the pivot as an opportunity for uh, ASEAN. Uh, one, uh, the proximity of uh, China makes uh, China a natural uh, uh, market for uh, ASEAN uh, countries. And as uh, China becomes uh, a market of last resort, similar to what the U.S. has been uh, to the rest of the world since World War uh, II, you can see um, uh, regional uh, supply chains emanating from China going to ASEAN and back to uh, uh, China. And this will help... Uh, uh, change the nature of our uh, trade uh, relationship. Uh, right now, uh, the, the bulk of uh, uh, exports of the region really is, is part of uh, global uh, uh, value chains. No? Uh, in fact, uh, um, the, the model is a fragmented one where the product is passed from one country to the other rather than from a producer to a consumer uh, relationship. So if uh, China has a dual circulation strategy, uh, I think ASEAN uh, should really take advantage of that and in fact uh, 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 create uh, an ASEAN circulation strategy as well, where uh, the hope is to increase intra-ASEAN uh, uh, trade and change the nature of intra-ASEAN uh, uh, trade from intermediate goods to final consumption uh, uh, goods. So intra-ASEAN trade has been stuck at around a quarter of uh, ASEAN trade uh, the past uh, uh, 20 um, 10, 15 years. And if you increase that to 40%, uh, uh, that should be uh, enough uh, stimulus uh, uh, for the um, uh, ASEAN uh, uh, economy to be able to cover uh, whatever will be uh, lost uh, from the shortening of global supply chains, especially as the, the advanced countries uh, are dealing with their domestic uh, uh, unemployment uh, uh, issues. So, uh, um, I, I think um, it's important that uh, uh, we continue to uh, uh, refocus uh, 
uh, and take advantage of the fact that uh, we are next door to what will ultimately be the largest market in the world. Right. Thank you. So it's an opportunity. Um, Dr. Lynn Kwok, uh, my question for you. I was struck by, uh, when you explained it, uh, the language, the importance of choosing the right words as you tread this path. Um, Indo-Pacific, um, its outlook, its not strategy. And I was also struck by what I think is ASEAN trying to have its cake and eat it too, which is uh, China, we would like all of the economic benefits from your camp, and at the same time, we'd like all of the security benefits from the U.S. camp. And I don't know if that's sustainable or not. My question is, um, does ASEAN feel good that it's being courted by both sides, or does it feel squeezed that it's being pressurized by both sides? I would say it's a bit of both. Um, uh, so in, in the sense of it being quoted by both sides, I sometimes think about an image that um, was often uh, used when uh, used about lawyers. So I was once a lawyer and, you know, lawyers have the most terrible um, reputation. And so you have uh, a picture of a cow and, um, and you have two disputing parties, two parties who, who don't get along. One is kind of tugging at the cow's head, one's tugging at the cow's tail, and you have someone in the middle milking it. And so that person in the middle allegedly um, was, a, was a lawyer milking the cow while two parties dispute. Um, so I wouldn't say that ASEAN is, um, is, is that party um, kind of milking the cow while the US and China, uh, what's a better word, war with each other. Um, but on the other hand, I think there have been some benefits for ASEAN in terms of uh, the United States paying it greater uh, regard. Um, China, you know, obviously um, showing how generous uh, a country it can be if only ASEAN countries can speak to um, its desires. So um, I, th I think a clear example, and Mr. Cesar Persema can correct me if I'm wrong, is that we saw the Trump administration uh, last year um, was it, yeah, I think it was last year, clarifying that the US-Philippines Mutual Defense Treaty um, actually did cover um, the South China Sea. Um, so there was a clarification of the Mutual Defense Treaty, which the Philippines had been urging for a long time. So that's just one small example of how I think um, the, the ASEAN countries have benefited from US-China uh, rivalry. Another example that took place just a few months ago Secretary Pompeo made a strong statement supporting the Abolition Tribunal ruling in the Philippines case against China. Now that um, ruling, that award, was issued on the 12th of July 2016. Uh, so that's um, a confirmation from the United States um, that comes four years late. Um, and I don't think anyone is under any illusion that that came as a result of US-China competition and promptings or urgings from the region that, you know, it's all well and good that the United States has what it calls its freedom of navigation operations through the South China Sea, protecting um, the South China Sea, um, which is South China Sea's openness. But for the Southeast Asian countries, what's really important is the tribunal ruling, which in essence clarified that literal countries in, in um, the, uh, surrounding the South China Sea enjoyed the exclusive economic zone, the economic rights in the exclusive economic zone, unencumbered by China's nine dash line or from any exclusive economic zone generated from uh, features in the South China Sea, called the Strat Leaves, right? To the south of the South China Sea. So these um, actions taken by the United States, you know, for whatever motivations, have benefited Southeast Asian countries. And so US China rivalry does. Um, I think to a certain extent, uh, help or, or um, it has led to uh, certain benefits for the region. On the other hand, you know, I wouldn't want to take this too far because at the end of the day, you know, with two superpowers uh, at, at such loggerheads, this is terribly destabilizing to the region. And I don't think anyone in the region wants to see all out combat uh, between the United States and China. They don't even want to see decoupling between the two powers necessarily. So um, 
if, if there have been some benefits, but I would say up to a point. And I think on, on balance, it's probably more negative than positive if uh, competition intensifies between the two superpowers. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Alex, uh, more of a point of clarification, uh, just so that uh, I understand it correctly, your view on Singapore's role. Um, is Singapore really large enough or material enough to be able to set its own standards in the face of techno-nationalism? Or is what you're saying that Singapore is creating a platform that allows interoperability between those standards and therefore sort of rises above the fray so you can have both WeChat and WhatsApp on the same phone? Is that what you're saying? Are you really saying that Singapore is going to set its own standard a third way? Oh, no, no. I'm just saying that, that Singapore do, is setting an example of not having to make a clear binary choice by doing the things that it is, it is doing. Um, I do think that Singapore um, is playing a very significant role among a coalition of the willing uh, countries like Japan and Australia uh, joining with Singapore, uh, you know, we have this, uh, we, we have Singapore um, looking to, uh, to promote uh, very specific rules around uh, sustainable supply chains. Um, Singapore is a critical mass of professional services firms, logistics companies, academic institutions, um, you know, multinational companies. And they're all, um, you know, they're all involved in capacity building. There are many, many different ways that capacity building is manifesting itself in Singapore as a center of innovation. So, and if you, if you couple that with the fact that Singapore has many, many different free trade agreements, right? It's a hyper-connected city. Uh, and it, it's, you know, it's got strong rule of law. It's, um, you know, it's got a good record um, of facilitating and enabling um, transparent, um, you know, collaborative uh, uh, trade. So I think in that regard, as a member of other, um, again, coalitions of the willing, and I, I do believe that the United States will eventually return to the Trans-Pacific Partnership. Um, you know, let's see, let's, let's get to January 20th first. Uh, you know, Biden will obviously uh, become the next president, president-elect. Uh, we'll, we'll see what happens in the first two years, probably not, but uh, depending on what happens in congressional elections and so forth, I do think that the U.S. will eventually come back to the TPP. So in that regard, Singapore, and I hate to say this, it sounds really cliche, Singaporeans don't like it when you say this, but Singapore is punching well above its weight uh, internationally when it comes to these types of, of coalitions. Right. Thank you. Okay. Now the moment that everyone's been waiting for, which is the questions from the audience. Uh, and I will take these democratically. So people have voted for the one they'd like to, uh, to see answered, except that the first question I would like to go to the one who was there first, an LSE student, masters in IR, uh, Dechen Rabgayal. And the question is, does China have a grand strategy? If not, does it need to have one? Who would like to take that question? Mm. How would I leave that question there for now? You guys can have a think about it and maybe we can address that right at the end. Let's go now democratically to the one that most people would like to see answered. Should ASEAN mimic the EU model in the future? Can I? Uh, yes, Tamura san. Yeah, since I moved to Singapore, I'm surprised. Uh, you know, I always have an analogy, you know, EU and uh, uh, ASEAN, uh, you know, when I was in Japan. Uh, you know, EU is basically, uh, you know, uh, generally speaking, uh, it's a Caucasian Christianity and the uh, same size of the economic uh, development stage. And for example, you know, richest country in our uh, EU is a Luxembourg, and the poorest country in the EU, uh, per capita wise, it's a Bulgaria. The difference per capita wise is four or five times. But in case of ASEAN, the uh, richest country is Singapore, and the poorest country, uh, 
Cambodia, yeah, per capita GDP wise, is 50 times different. Yes, that's right. And also, you know, the regime wise, the type of regime, you know, also Italian regime, democratic regime, and a presidential system, cabinet parliament system, all the type of regime happens in ASEAN. And the different economic development is so, so diverse. And also ethnicity, religion wise, all religion in the world is here. All the ethnicity is here. And the resource wise, EU has a budget enough to have their own parliament, and enough to have own their administrative uh, branch. But ASEAN, there's no resource like that. There's no president of ASEAN. There's no uh, parliament of ASEAN. There's not, a, you know, administrative branches. I guess the question is, should it go that way? What's your view? It's, it's no. premature, it's so diverse. It's, it's too, too fragmented, I think. I, I agree. Uh, and if, I, if I may add, uh, Ludwig, I agree that uh, ASEAN shouldn't go the way of EU. Uh, we should continue to learn from the experience of ASEAN. Uh, the, in addition to the differences that uh, what Arusan mentioned, uh, we don't have a Germany in our midst that can actually fund uh, uh, a lot of these uh, uh, necessary expenses of integration. But there are things we can do to uh, uh, improve integration. For example, uh, the ASEAN six agreeing to a common customs border uh, or harmonizing uh, standards, regulations, improving digital connectivity and uh, uh, physical uh, connectivity. There are a lot of things short of what the EU uh, has done uh, that can really improve the lot of ASEAN. Thank you. Can I ask a question to Chris uh, Masan on that uh, issue because then he's a member of the uh, member country's uh, representative. So, you know, you have, uh, instead of having uh, Germany or France, you have Indonesia. It's 40% of the population, 40% of GDP of the total ASEAN, the big boy. So do you think Indonesia can lead the, uh, uh, you know, ASEAN, uh, for the further development of ASEAN as a community, ASEAN as an entity, or Indonesia won't? Uh, Indonesia is very important uh, for many uh, uh, reasons. Uh, you know, you can mention the fact that it's the largest moderate Islam uh, uh, population in the region, and that's crucial to maintaining uh, uh, harmony in the uh, region, but it doesn't have the financial resources of uh, uh, Germany. But clearly, uh, Indonesia is going to be a uh, a key player in the uh, region. Right. If Maybe, might, uh, yeah, please. Sorry, if I might jump in, I think I absolutely agree with uh, with uh, the former speakers about um, the views on whether or not, you know, the EU should be a model uh, for ASEAN. And I think um, the answer is no, it shouldn't be a model because there are distinct differences and the formalization um, uh, probably uh, of the EU model uh, probably will not work very well in the ASEAN context. And I think uh, the for, uh, a former Secretary General of ASEAN uh, framed this very well about how uh, the EU can be looked towards for ideas, but not as a model. Um, so I think that's what uh, Mr. Cesar Persima might have been alluding to. We can um, generate in inspiration from the EU model. And I would highlight I mean, perhaps three points. First, um, the and I think ASEAN has adopted this, um, greater economic integration uh, to achieve uh, stronger political and security ties between the countries. Second, I think the EU is inspirational in the sense of its emphasis on values and norms. And I think ASEAN is moving in that direction. I, and I think that is also a very positive development. And third, um, the European identity. I think that is probably uh, more well-developed than an ASEAN identity. Um, and we need to think about more creative ways about developing an ASEAN identity. It's usually not very exciting. So I used to also work in um, a TV news station. And I remember that, you know, covering um, both EU as well as ASEAN events were not terribly exciting because all you had were pictures of, of meetings and talking heads. And, you know, it's, it's not very captivating. Most, um, most um, ads or, um, uh, publicity coming out from ASEAN. It, it, it looks very 19, I don't know, 1970s, 1980s. And we could have more exciting things, particularly to uh, captivate the youth um, in, in the region. Um, so we, we should be thinking about more interesting and innovative ways uh, to promote an ASEAN identity and moving towards a greater ASEAN identity. Um, and I'll leave it there. 
Thank you. That certainly uh, makes sense to me as well. The, I, I sometimes joke that the only place where I see actually Asian identity um, is in the canteens of Western universities. Um, back over here, you know, it's not really Asian, ASEAN, it's the country identity. Um, and, and maybe the question should also be, what can the EU learn from ASEAN? Because the EU is unable to deal with diversity of the kind that Tamura Sun has just asked. It can't deal with uh, you know, one turkey on the doorstep, and uh, it's relatively, relatively homogenous. Okay, the next question is from Kathy Mao, says a G11 student in China. Um, hello, professors. As Biden has been elected president, how would you predict the future U.S.-China relationship, and how will this predicted future relationship affect Asian countries? I can take that, Lupe. Um, I would say that the, the, the U.S.-China trajectory is not going to change. Uh, the, the style uh, of communication will change. I think the, the Biden administration um, will, uh, uh, certainly there'll be no more uh, tweets, uh, and no more sort of, you know, knee-jerk, incoherent uh, sort of proclamations. I think Biden is a multilateralist, uh, believes in multilateral institutions. Um, and I, I think from a uh, from a trade perspective, uh, I think there will be discussions that will continue, but, the, but the, the issues that will remain problematic will be those core issues in China around a state capitalist system, which involves subsidies, which involve you know, you know, hyper-protectionism of state-owned enterprises, IP transfer and IP theft. Uh, those, will, those will remain issues. The other thing is, is that if one looks at uh, Joe Biden's um, national policies around build back better, which is the, the campaign slogan, right? Build back better. This involves, and again, this is gonna also depend on what happens in the Senate, uh, whether or not we have an obstructionist, you know, split uh, polarized Senate. But, but if, if Biden is able to do this, um, we will see massive spending in the United States to uh, return or to reshore strategic industries back to the United States, massive spending on R&D around a digital uh, and, and, and IT, spending around digital infrastructure, the Moonshot program, you know, the Moonshot 2, if you will, uh, program. Uh, and so, you know, Biden, uh, Mr. Biden's policies about bringing jobs back and essentially rebuilding the American middle class, uh, you know, which has been decimated over the past three plus decades because of technology uh, displacement and also because of, of, of some you know, loss of jobs through trade. I think Biden is very much going to continue and probably will will uh, achieve effectively uh, what what the Trump administration actually wanted to do. Um, again, you know, well, you know, while I have you here, um, Alex, will he join TPP or seek to join CPTPP? Well, look, it's a very sensitive topic. Trade is a very sensitive topic, and you know, if you look at the traditional conservative position on on free trade, um, it's it's sort of eroded. Uh, you know, because again, you know, if, uh, the, if you're a conservative or Republican, you're not going to get elected in the United States unless you appease Trump's base. Um, and so, uh, and, and the same thing with the far left. They've turned, you know, they've, they've never been big fans of, of trade and, and Biden is going to have to appease um, sort of the so-called progressive uh, wing of the Democratic Party. Having said that, I think, again, depending on how the first two years go in terms of what gets done, uh, you know, uh, if Biden is, is moderately successful uh, and things go moderately well, I do think that, that um, there's a very good chance that with a little bit of tweaking, you know, restoring these, those 20 plus provisions that have essentially been put on hold around, you know, e-commerce and digital trade, sort of put them back in Make it look like they've renegotiated it, et cetera. Um, I do think that it's 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 possible. 
the possibility that something like what Canada did, I guess, before they they joined, or they, do, do, do they need more tweaking? More yes, so I, yes. Canada was instrumental in getting the word progressive uh, in, in the CPTPP. Uh, yes, that's what I'm learning today from both you and and Lynn Kwok. Language is everything that matters. Okay, next question is from Peter Donor from Ghent University, Belgium. Are there currently any... Sorry, um, Lynn. I would like to jump in to address uh, this point on the future of uh, US-China relations, because I think that's a very important one. Um, as we said, it's, it's going to affect uh, the rest of uh, Asia. Um, and, and so I think I would agree with um, Alex uh, when he talked about how you know, the structural issues are here to stay. So Trump has been blamed for the downturn, uh, President Trump has been blamed for the downturn in uh, US-China relations. Uh, his trade war certainly didn't help, nor did his um, rhetoric um, upon the China election chances. That also did not help the relationship. But the relationship between the United States and China had been deteriorating and continues to deteriorate over a whole range of issues, whether the South China Sea, trade and other economic issues, um, Taiwan, Hong Kong, human rights, um, that that has all hurt uh, the US-China relationship. Moreover, what has developed over time is that these issues are no longer looked upon as issues that need to be resolved between the two parties, but as issues that can help one side get a leg up over the other. So it's not, let's solve you know, trade disputes, or let's solve technology, um, or let's solve disputes in the South China Sea and talk about how, you know, certain rights are uh, enshrined in their own cost. It's become, let's use this as a means to gain advantage over the other side. So that's very, very dangerous um, uh, and very problematic. So whether we see a reversal um, under the under Biden administration, that's an open question. Um, and I think um, while the relationship is certainly in for troubled times, nothing is preordained, right? Um, it's, it's not necessarily going to be a, a sharp downturn and that's going to be trouble, but we don't know that it's going to be a dismal affair. And I think what we need to be looking at are three points. First, um, uh, the extent to which a Biden administration can generate or create areas of mutual interest between the United States and China. Um, you know, two obvious areas um, are you know working together on the pandemic, as well as climate change. And um, I think a third uh, issue that. Uh, Biden uh, highlighted in a piece that he wrote for the Foreign Affairs uh, several months ago was non-proliferation. So the ability to create areas of uh, cooperation, which then must be integrated in other aspects of the relationship. I think this was done quite successfully during the Obama administration, but I think we're in danger of throwing things out of the top water. So all of a sudden we heard that you know, the Obama administration was was a, a dismal um, administration in terms of relationships. I think in some respects we need to preserve the good aspects of it. And then so that was the first point, whether the Biden administration will be able to identify areas yeah. of mutual okay. Second, whether or not where there is um, where there is uh, competition, whether or not that can take place within some certain frameworks, uh, certain bounds and frameworks. So within the framework of international law and multilateral institutions. I think Biden has indicated that he will work within the framework of um, multilateral institutions, so that's a positive development. And third, and the ideological competition, to the extent that US-China competition becomes increasingly ideological, I think that will deepen um, uh, uh, problematic relations between the United States and China Thanks. and possibly work against the United States. Okay, thank, thank you. Tamara-san, very quickly, please, we'll go to the next question after that. Yeah, so uh, they're gonna escalate uh, on, uh, in the near term because, you know, uh, before the pandemic, it said uh, uh, China will uh, said to be uh, ex exceeding the GDP wise the US in 2024. But after the pandemic, uh, given the situation, uh, China seems like a totally controlling the pandemic. The uh, US is, you know, very troublesome. So maybe uh, in his term uh, until 2024, uh, US will be exceeded by China GDP wise. That's a bad, bad news. Uh, but uh, as uh, everyone's saying, they can uh, find out a mutually understanding point. But you know, three uh, points they don't, uh, uh, they, they cannot agree totally. One is the uh, role of the states. The other one is the information creation. Third one is the uh, style of the government. 
these are, you know, sorts of the dis disagreement, you know, more like uh, ideology. So besides that, they can come uh, to understand each other and they come to uh, agree, you know, climate change, SDGs and, uh, you know, IP issues. They come to understand and they can mutually formulate the international platform. But those three value uh, proposition kind of things, they cannot agree. And in the short term, uh, you know, uh, contentious uh, relationship might intensify because of the, you know, economic trajectory of the two countries. Right. And now after the pandemic, it's, you know, certainly different. Okay, thank you. Uh, the question is about ASEAN. Does the ability of ASEAN countries to opt out of certain policies weaken rather than strengthen ASEAN? And let me couple this with the next question by Philip Shetler Jones, who's basically saying, is it viable, as Bilahari Kausikan said in, a, in a, an article recently, is it possible or should it be possible for ASEAN to expel a member? So the two together, you can opt out and should it be possible for ASEAN to expel a member? Uh, Mr. Cesar Purisema, would you like to take that? Yeah, sure, sure. Um, I think the ability of um, uh, ASEAN countries to opt out, what they call the ASEAN way, has been crucial in uh, uh, holding ASEAN uh, uh, together. Um, it was mentioned earlier that the differences among the countries in terms of development, uh, uh, fin uh, uh, financial resources, etc., systems, uh, is quite uh, substantial and clearly uh, giving each other the time to uh, uh, opt in to certain agreements is crucial. I'll give you an example. When we were negotiating the free trade agreement with uh, uh, China, at the start of the process, uh, there was an early harvest uh, uh, program. And many countries actually opted out, including uh, uh, the Philippines. Uh, but uh, when we saw what was happening, uh, those that uh, uh, agreed to be part of the early harvest program, uh, we decided to opt in. You know? So it gives you uh, time to uh, uh, get your uh, local political dynamics uh, uh, in order and understand uh, how uh, you can uh, uh, participate you know, uh, to your advantage. I think uh, that's been a very good uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, to expel, uh, I, I don't think so, uh, because uh, uh, one of the things that um, ASEAN really has uh, also uh, done is create an environment of harmony and peace uh, in the uh, region. Uh, I think we can agree to disagree on certain uh, uh, things, uh, but I think the important thing is we focus on the common interests uh, that will uh, allow us to move uh, uh, forward. But if the question is in, in an environment of resurgent conflict, heightening tensions, is the ASEAN way still the right way? Is it, is it still fit for purpose going forward? Um, I, I think so, uh, because the, uh, as we uh, discussed uh, earlier, some of these issues are very uh, uh, difficult. No? And uh, uh, given the increasing, uh, for example, uh, uh, political uh, economic influence that uh, uh, China has across the region, but uh, disproportionately, for example, in some uh, uh, countries, they're able to, for example, um, split us no? uh, and create uh, uh, difficulties uh, in terms of coming up with a common uh, uh, position. So agreeing to uh, uh, proceed with uh, others opting out no? uh, gives us uh, an opportunity to move forward no? uh, without breaking up uh, uh, the aggregation. Thank you. Uh, so Sorry, Lynn, would you like to say something? Well, I'd like to address Dr. Shetler Jones' point because it's a very interesting one. Um, should we expel Laos and Cambodia um, for, according to Bihari, if I remember his um, point in his article correctly, what he was saying is that you know, these countries consistently adopt uh, a pro -China, uh, pro China approach and fail to take into account the broader ASEAN interests. Um, and so I think once we start going down that route, uh, we have several difficulties. The first would be, you know, who decides um, whether or not um, uh, someone, a country is taking a pro-China approach? Um, and also if we start explaining to people what's perceived as a pro-US approach, um, will we have anyone left um, in the ASEAN block after that? Do we start expelling one by one? And will, 
who should be the ones deciding um, whether or not certain parties should be expelled should be the rest of the members as a, a unanimous decision. And will there be anyone actually agreeing to this? Because at the back of their mind, they're probably thinking about the precedent that they create and whether or not one day they are going to find themselves on the other side of the fence. And I think one possibility that we might want to explore a little bit more or ASEAN might want to use a little bit more is the, the, the notion of ASEAN minus. We kind of move forward on certain issues um, where there is a smaller group within ASEAN who have interests. In so I think that would be a very strong option for issues like the South China Sea. Thank you. So the next question is from Slovenia. Uh, with China overtaking the US as the European bloc's largest trading partner in October, where and how is the EU likely to position itself in all of this, especially after the election of President Biden? Alex Capri. Yeah, and um, Europe is, is in a very unique position. Europe is still very, very focused on uh, key elements of the transatlantic uh, relationship. Um, when it comes to uh, partnerships around AI ethics, development of, uh, of technologies, again, going back to what I talked about in my opening remarks um, around these, these, these frameworks and these values, Europe is very much, um, uh, looking to sort of rebalance and, and uh, improve its ties, despite the fact that they have completely, not, not completely, but very different views around uh, data privacy with the GDPR, for example. They are really going after big American tech companies uh, under antitrust rules. Despite all of that, Europe is realigning and will strengthen its ties with the United States because it's recalibrating um, its relationship with China due to the South China Sea, due to human rights violations in Xinjiang province, the, you know, the national security law. So in that regard, I do see the, the transatlantic relationship um, doing just fine. Uh, but they will, of course, continue to trade with China. Uh, they, they, you know, the EU parliament has, has described China as a systemic uh, rival. Um, they will decouple strategically, as I discussed, but they will continue to trade in the more innocuous areas. Um, you might even see an increase in trade in those areas. So um, I, I, I would expect that. I, I wish we had time to go back to that last question, but I'm going to have to skip over that one. <laughs> well, we have time for one last question. I'm going to go right to the bottom of the chat room. And this is from the University of Bradford, UK, Angie Hesham. With President-elect Biden, uh, he made a reference to bringing like-minded allies to punish China economically, um, which is what will be his policy regarding South China Sea. For countries that are directly affected by that conflict, is this a welcome statement or does it make things worse? What is the statement? I didn't hear it, uh, Ludwig. That uh, we will, together with like-minded uh, allies, punish China economically for its positions in, in the South China Sea. Helpful or un unhelpful? If, if you ask me, uh, being from the uh, Philippines, that would make the situation uh, uh, more uh, difficult. Uh, uh, for uh, us. Uh, in, in fact, uh, as I mentioned in my uh, opening remark, it's important that uh, we try and uh, decouple uh, uh, the economic uh, uh, aspects of our relationship from uh, the geopolitical aspects of our relationship. Uh, we should probably agree to disagree on uh, our uh, dispute in the South China Sea and put it to the side of our relationship and focus on the win-win uh, aspects of our, our relationship because uh, uh, territorial issues are uh, uh, is a lose-lose issue you know uh, it's hard to uh, uh, resolve on a win-win uh, uh, basis that is why uh, for example a recent development involving Philippines and China where there was agreement uh, uh, to jointly develop uh, some of the uh, disputed areas I think is a way uh, uh, forward 
so uh, I don't really uh, subscribe to that of uh, you know uh, punishing uh, China. Plus the fact that uh, uh, China is a big elephant. Uh, yeah. Talking about the elephants, and it's hard to uh, punish uh, 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 an uh, elephant without creating really uh, a big fight. And uh, as a result, uh, as I mentioned earlier, so, uh, we get to be the grass that will be trampled. So I'm not in support of that. Does that comment? Uh, oh, sorry. Does that comment uh, done by after he's elected or before elected? I don't know the answer to that, unfortunately. Oh. So anyway, he's a president elect still. Yes. And the China is not admitting that he, uh, China is not saying congratulations to him in not yet, diplomatically. So okay. that's the reason why. And that, that situation, he can say anything and China doesn't take it very seriously. So after okay. he's uh, inaugurated, he will change attitude to China. Uh, okay. You know, I don't know. Any, we just have a few, uh, a few seconds left. Any last comments from either Alex Capri or Lin Kwok? Um, I'd like to address the question. Um, so I think language on punishment, I think that, that is relatively unhelpful. Uh, I suspect that he will be more nuanced in office. Um, he has talked about, you know, having not just to be a strong power, but a smart power. And if, if so, then um, what we might see is a continuation of the US principled approach in the South China Sea that it recently adopted, what I mentioned earlier, you know, supporting the South China Sea Tribunal Award. Um, under President Obama, I think the United States made the best statement I've seen coming out of the United States about uh, US interests in the South China Sea and how that's related, uh, how the South China Sea dispute is, uh, relates to adherent, uh, the rules-based order and how when that is undermined in the South China Sea, it's undermined as elsewhere as well. So I expect the strength of legitimacy to be combined, hopefully, with um, with more power dynamics, where you know the United States continues to assert maritime rights um, and freedoms in the South China Sea, together with its allies and partners. So legitimacy plus power is what I hope to see moving forwards. Probably less um, in terms of unhelpful terminology like punish. Right. Right. Alex. Last word. Not much to add to Professor Kwok there. I, I, I do think that, again, um, the pivot to Asia that began under the Obama administration, if, if at all possible, again, pending politics, domestic politics, um, will, will continue. Um, and, and, you know, certainly, um, you know, we mentioned the, the, the TPP. And the one thing, the one bipartisan issue um, I think that exists where both sides of the aisle agree is on China. Um, that's about the only thing that Republicans and Democrats can agree upon is, uh, is you know, dealing with the various facets of China that we've discussed. So, um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave it there. Right. Okay, thank you so much. We've come to the end of our time now. Uh, there will be a short feedback form at the end of it when you close your browser. Would be, would be very grateful if you were to fill that out. My immense gratitude to the panelists, the distinguished panel. This is not a great time zone, uh, time for anyone of, of you. And you've done this for the benefit of the UK and European audience. So huge thanks to all of you. And with that, we bring this to a close. Thank you. Thank you. ありがとうございます。